Hello and welcome back to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos and I'm here with, um, I'm, I, I love all my guests, but this one I'm particularly thrilled to, to have, William or Billy Gorta. Okay, hi, I'm Billy Gorta. I, uh, I was uh, one of the, we like to call ourselves the, the founding fathers of CompStat. I was one of them. Uh, I joined the police department in 1980. I retired in 2000. I was captain when I left. Billy and I have did speak uh, about, uh, I don't know, eight years ago, I uh, I met you in a bar in Queens, actually, first. Station and, bar. Good, uh, good first, bar. Actually, first I met you through a friend after a Met game at a bar on oh, Queens that's Boulevard. Right. Yes, that's uh, true. I was only telling that story. Yeah, I was with my friends Heather and Jordan. You knew Heather. Um, well, I was, no, I was with Heather. Oh, with that's right. <laughs> and we walked in, and it was a Donegal bar, and the Sam McGuire, the tr- Irish football trophy, was on the bar when we came in. The only time that's- I've ever been in there. Um, and me too. And, uh, so then we met at the station bar and I interviewed you. It was one of the first interviews I did for my upcoming book about the crime drop in New York city. And I've been going over these interviews and finally working on it for real. And, uh, it remains, um, one of my favorites. Uh, and it's a great part of the story that, um, people don't know because it's, you know, people who have any interest in this know, oh, Comstat, that was a big deal. Bratton brought, brought in Comstat. And if you know a bit more, you go, oh, Jack Maple and, uh, and Lou Animone had something to do with that. And boy, I, the one missing voice in my book is Jack Maple, but it's hard to interview him because. A lot of mercy on him. So uh, I, I, I invited Gorda to come back and, and talk to me about this stuff um, because I wanted to, um, we'll have it in podcast form. Uh, I was pretty much drifting aimlessly as a teenager. My father said, why don't you take some of these civil service tests? I took the police test and it sort of came up, you know? And um, you bounced around a lot. You have a, you seem yeah. proud that you have a bad, now you seem like a nice guy to me, but you claim that, that you're hard to work with. And um, I can't yeah, I'm hard to work with them. Let's, let's say I'm hard to supervise. Hard to supervise, but you had, um, so you, you become a Sergeant 80, 85, I think. A cop at Queens, I went to the Bronx. I was in the 4-7 and the 4-4 as a sergeant in the Bronx. You have a special skill, you said, something that, that made you stand out. What was that? Well, I mean, I have an odd skill set, as I like to say. You know, was, I'm, I'm, I write pretty well. I, I, I have a degree in writing, so I write pretty well, and I'm numerate. I'm good at math. And the other thing is, it's like, you know, as far as department politics go, um, I, you know, I'm very good at the politics, except I'm not a practitioner. I'm like a baseball player who's a 260 hitter, you know, but has, you know, really understands the game. So I make a great manager. I make a great color guy, but just not going to be a long term major leaguer in the politics game. I can whisper in your ear. I can tell you what's going to happen. But uh, uh, I do it myself because I have no I have no patience and I have to I have to. Uh, what's the expression we use these days? Uh, speak my truth. You know, an old Irish guy once told me, you know, you should always tell the truth, but you shouldn't always be telling it. And uh, that was often, often my problem in a police department. Uh, but it's still, you get, you ended up in headquarters. So um, um, describe if you could, actually, maybe even before you got there, how, what was the, how did, how did the NYPD compile stats, um, you know, up through the early, up through 1990? Well, um, the, every, uh, every, uh, precinct kept their own stats and then eventually they sent them down to headquarters to the arrest and crime coding section who then took them and then sort of normalized them or whatever they did down there and then sent them over to to sent them to DC or sent them wherever the FBI then compiled their stats and eight months after the crime happens or eight months after the year ended then you get last year's stats so it wasn't a it, it wasn't a uh, uh, a really big super thing. I mean, I think the goal of most precinct commanders was, no, I mean, crime is, imp- crime is somewhat important, but not as important as not having scandal, you know, not having corruption or somebody or bad shooting or some sort of racial incident. The best way, you know, if crime was, that was, that was the B matter, you know, you wanted up, you wanted to avoid all of the really bad stuff. Uh, up Do front. you think that was a legacy of the NAP commission or where did that come from? Um, I think it tends to be, you know, uh, you know, the other thing is like, you know, bad, bad publicity is just bad. And, you know, then, then like they used to say, like, if, uh, you know, when I was a rookie cop, it's like, oh, the CEO knows your name. That can't be good. You know, so you don't want to be up in the lights for that. So, you know, and crime, the generally the acceptance is like crime happens, you know, outside the right. Can't kill Abel right outside the gates of, uh, of, uh, 
uh, the Garden of Eden. Homicide number one. All right. And, you know, like some of the stuff you, they really truly believed you couldn't prevent all of it. You can't prevent all of it, but you could prevent a lot of it, as it turns out. But, uh, uh, you know, it's funny uh, when I started they, this, this they, project, I thought um, it was going to be purely historical, but it's just amazing um, how everything seems to be coming around again in terms of the police role and of crime, in terms of disorder in the city, all that stuff. It's, it's unfortunately, well, I'm, I'm I mean, afraid the book's going to be current. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, we're, you know, pick your imagery, whether it's a, a, a circle or, or a pendulum, you know, it goes around or swings back and forth. And now you're swinging in one way and something will happen that will force it to swing the other way or go, go or, or spin faster. It's just it's the way of the world. You know, we just keep doing the same thing over and over again. That's, you know. So could, could you provide um, as a native born New Yorker? Um, what was the tone in the light, tone of the city like with with crime and Dinkins and and what's what what what's the the table setting for um for the for for Comstat? Well, okay, so even before Dinkins, it was starting to you know the, you know like you know, all the subway graffiti, all of that, all you know the the ga- gangs, the wildings, the this, the that, the, all of that stuff, you know, and it was just building till you know, um, and Dinkins, fair or not, had this reputation as being completely aloof and uninterested. He wanted to play tennis. He didn't want to, he didn't want to get involved in the nitty gritty. So, uh, you know, and as things were going and there was some racial buildup, there was, I don't know if you remember, there was a, a boycott in, um, Harlem. in Brooklyn over Freddy's. the, um, the what? Oh, I'm th- the I'm Koreans with Freddy's. Is that the, was that the Korean place? The I Korean grocer? Uh, no, I think so. this was, oh, okay. this was a Korean grocer and, the local some people in the in the in the local black community said you know like they were rude or racist because they wouldn't like touch you when they, they would drop the change into your hand, and uh, you know then you know then as these things escalate and then uh, then there's a boycott a demo outside and the mayor's like yeah no I'm I'm cool I'm not getting involved in that shit <laughs> and so. Um, uh, you know, so it was like building to building to finally, and then whatever crime was happening, and, you know, it was it was going up um, till finally, uh, uh, you know, the, one of the papers, uh, you know, uh, put uh, do something, Dave, on the front page. You yeah, know, right there was ah, uh, yeah, but Dave, do something. Yeah, there you go. Got it. I can see it. But you know, <laughs> and uh, that was in response to um, um, the Utah tourist who. Uh, was stabbed and killed. Was that the, oh, was that Brian Watkins? Yeah. yeah. That was a few, that was and, a few you know, days after that. We're talking, this is uh, the papers, um, September 7th, 1990. Which paper was that? The Post. I was eventually corn editor of that newspaper, but that's another story. That's another lifetime. But, um, uh, uh, you know, and it was just like building and then... Um, I, was he still mayor when they brought in Lee Brown? Yeah. You know, and out of town, uh, Brown. like out of town, Brown. Well, you know, he wasn't, you know, the problem is they got hung up on the, the community policing thing, which is not the worst idea in the world, but the way they had it set up. And, you know, I was in the office this doing some of the implementations. Right? Yeah. yeah. When I was in chief of patrol. But the problem is, is that, you know, uh, this problem solving method was, and, as much of this is still like this. It's the other city agencies, you know, you say what you want about the police department. All right. It's got more soft spots than a banana. But, all right, it is the easily the finest run department in the city by orders of magnitude. Okay. You pick it, they're all bad. So basically, like, the, again, the broken windows things, you know, I have this empty lot, it's strewn with garbage, it makes me feel bad and want to commit crime or whatever. So, uh, you know, they either have the cops organize community cleanups or they basically bully or bribe the sanitation department to do an edge job. So, uh, you know, so now you got <clears throat> some some kid cop and, and, you know, chances are he's coming from Long Island or somewhere in sub- suburb land. We like to blame Long Island for everything, but he's coming from somewhere in suburb land. And, uh, you know, now he's supposed to be the problem solver, you know, and, you know, and so it was all, it was just all wrong. Now, it was a very good basis for when Bratton came in, you know, because then Kelly kept it going. And when Bratton came in, it was like, 
we could then rely on that saying, trust us, okay? We're friends, you know us now because we spent a lot of time in the community. And that's how, that's how a lot of the things early on in, well, not in Comstat, but in the, the, the crime uh, um, reduction was like, you know, hey, you know us, we can, you know, we've been around here for a while. So yeah. um, please, uh, you know, interject or correct me if I, I'm wrong, but um, to sort of fill in, fill in the timeline here. So Bratton comes to New York around uh, first around 91 to run the transit police, which transit, at that time was right. a separate agency. And graffiti had already been cleaned up at this point. That was a clean cars program was from 83 to 88. Um, but it, um, and the MTA got a, whatever it was called then, got a money to actually make the system better at some level. Um, but Bratton came into transit and shaped up that department, uh, according to people who were there, uh, got him new uniforms, better equipment, radios that worked, and the all-important uh, nine-millimeter semi-automatic clock, and got the agency accredited. So it had been sort of a, a bastard stepchild of, of policing, uh, sort of, you know, got their groove back to a certain extent. Um, he um, then went back to Boston, took over the Boston P- Police Department um, before um before Giuliani became became mayor when he was appointed commissioner of the NYPD. Now, crime, um, a lot of cops were hired under Dinkins, uh, and that also helped him when he came back. Right. Um, 8,000, I think, was the number. I'm sorry, say it again. This safe Street, Safe City gave us an extra eight. And this 8, was... 8,000. And this was... Um, I don't have the number. After hiring. I mean, the department was huge by the time he got there. Uh, and I, I have think, opinions on that, too. I don't think we need all of those cops. Uh, I think we need to put our, the, the cops in the right places, never mind just having bodies, you um, know, but that's another story. You know, there's it's amazing compared to other cities, uh, other big cities like L.A. or Dallas, just how many cops New York City has. Um, so, uh, but I know reasons for that, too. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Uh, oh, so when were you? Were you? You weren't at? Uh, well, I don't know. Were you at the uh, the city hall riots against uh, that children? Oh yes, I was. Oh, oh yes, I was. Uh, tell me about that, please. Well, I was working. I was a lieutenant in. I might have been the administrator. or was a special projects guy in Patrol Borough Manhattan South. So I was working. I was in uniform, and um, uh, and this this sort of will build into Louis's fame as well. Because what happened is, it's like the whole thing, you know, the cops down, you know, they're marching around. And it would have been a victory because they encircled all the city hall, the big line of cops. This was going to be great. And, and so why, why, were they pro, why were they there in the first place? I think it was, was it money? Was it working conditions? Was it just, I hate Dinkins? It was all of that, but the specific thing was um, CCRB. Okay, I, I, I'm... I can buy that. It's it's not but this was the, after, in the forefront of my memory, but this okay. was after Crown Heights. I mean, that's what they, you know, because I've just looked at these news stories from then. But but it had been building because um Dinkins was seen as ineffectual in Crown Heights, um, where cops were shot. He uh, visited the funeral of uh what was his Pico Garcia? Of Kika. Yep. Um mm-hmm. anyway, there, there's there's a lot of backstory here that right. you know uh the the rabbits anyway. Um anyway, so they were all mad. And then somebody, and you know, given it was, you know. You know, the, the sun was over the yard. So Caruso, yard on Caruso, the union had is Somebody. calling for this 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 protest at City Hall. He... Right, and it was it could have been a victory. I mean, they were there. It was peaceful. It was fine. They practically encircled the whole block. There was like time to declare victory and go home. No, some idiot yells, "Let's take the bridge," because uh, uh, like Reverend Al or other protesters were allowed to take Brooklyn Bridge. So they take Brooklyn Bridge. I don't know, and then they decide to storm City Hall. You know, I I have to believe alcohol was involved in here somehow. Uh, so they decided to storm City Hall. There was myself and a couple other lieutenants. There might have been a sergeant and then maybe a couple of sergeants, but bosses from Patrol Bar Manhattan South standing there at the top of the steps of City Hall. And here comes here comes the mob. And it's like my comrades seeing this, my comrades in the intelligence division inside City Hall slammed the metal gates shut inside. So now we have no place to retreat. The back is against the glass. This is it. So fortunately, the guys running up the running up the steps, you know, when they got to the top, they go, whoa. And it's like, you know, like, let's not crush these guys. But yeah, I was standing there when, uh, you know, uh, I, I was standing there when they tried to take City Hall. Actually, I was standing at the door. I, I'll take credit for the whole thing. I prevented it. So there. <laughs> um, and, and who were your sympathies with at the time? 
I mean, yeah, you know, this is cop on cop. No. Cop on cop, right. But listen, I love a cop. I get it. But, you know, sometimes it's it's much more complicated than, you know, hey, this fucking guy, you know? So, you know, you know, I, I feel both ways because, you know, I understand that there are management prerogatives. I understand there were political pressures on the mayor, on the police commission, or on, on, uh, on all the people through. You know, maybe sergeants, lieutenants, considerably less so, but they have careers, you know. And the cops, you know, not noted as the, the deepest thinkers of all time. Just like, yeah, I'll fuck this and, you know, this guy. And you know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, but I, you know, I, I respect them. I love them. And I understand the, the, the respect the work they do and the hours they put in, the sacrifices they make. But Jesus, like, let's, let's think this through a little bit, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I go both ways. Did, did, were you, um, afraid, did, I'm thinking now January 6th in the Capitol, um, storming, did, were you, you know, afraid that this, of getting killed? Oh, oh, I, yeah, just by accident, not like they were going to, you know, stop me to death so they could uh, get in there and, and turn the flag upside down. I was more afraid of getting killed by accident because the thing is that the guys at the top of the steps, they stop, see us, they stop, you know fair play, but the guys at the bottom of the steps can't see anything. So I'm much more worried about the surge forward, the unknowing surge forward, than about, oh, these guys are going to, you know, we got to go hand to hand here, because they weren't going to do that. You know, I mean, you know, they're not going to beat up a lieutenant to go into City Hall, and they weren't going to get it anyway. Thanks, again, thanks to my cowardly friends in the intelligence division, but hey, <laughs> you know, yeah, but being, by being accidentally crushed, yeah, that was a legit fear. And did you see any of the actions um, from your perch uh, that that led to what being called the city hall riot? I did not. The, I mean, the I think the city hall the, riot was. I the, think the, the city hall riot was them trying to. I think the city hall riot was them trying to take city hall. I mean, you know, did I see anybody drinking tins of beer? Not really, because they weren't. There was only like at the very end they decided to come and take the hall. So whatever they were doing out on Broadway or on the bridge, yeah, I didn't really see it. How over it was the the racism that from the crowd. Um, again, I wasn't there for that part of, of the game. You know, I, I was just there. And then it was like, then the chiefs come screaming, you know, okay, call a mobilization, get, you know, clear it up. Like, you know, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it was pretty aftermathy. Okay. It was my involvement at the very tail end of it. I mean, I wasn't out, you know, I wasn't out trying to police this crowd. Thank God. Wow. So think, uh, had you not been working, would have you gone to the, the rally? No. No, don't don't do demos. Don't do any of that. None of that's you know, you know. My opinions are my own. You know, I'm um, I'm fine with that. Yeah. So, um, uh, but so, so one of my pro. That was also one of my part part of my problems in well my entire life. Catholic school and the police department is like I'm not a joiner. I don't like not a team guy. So it's like yeah, let's all go. Yeah, no, go ahead, leave me alone. <laughs> you know, because it happened once. So I was at a funeral for a kid I knew. He was a cop. And he committed suicide with a mercy on him. But, um, you know, I went, I, but I knew him. I knew his father from when I was a child. So I went, I wore a suit. And somebody says to me, why don't you, uh, why aren't you in uniform? And I says, because I don't need the uniform. Wherever I go, I go as Billy Gorda. So it doesn't matter what, I, what I'm wearing. So, you know, that's that it, not quite the police department way, you know. So um, running, so and Giuliani was, he was inciting that crowd there at City Hall, but so he, he runs, I, 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 I assume on many things, but crime was a big part of his campaign, um, getting the city back in order. Um, interestingly, often he gets credit for, uh, for taking care of the squeegee men. That actually preceded him in Bratton. So Bratton told me we're happy to take credit if people want to give it to us, but actually that was that was pretty much resolved before they got there. Um, and um, Bratton comes in and and if uh, he does a house cleaning, right? Could you could you could you talk about that? Yeah, uh, uh, he just I, you know I thought you know um, he went with all new guys. He went, he was he was tired and and. In many ways, he's the only guy who could have done this because, like, in the in the old police department, again, if you live long enough and you kept your nose clean, chances are you would get a bump up here. And Kelly was very fond of the old guys. He didn't. This is Ray Kelly, the who preceded Ray Kelly, who and was, followed Bratton later. Right. But he, uh, 
he, he, you know, he was a fan of old guys. You know, he didn't count your accomplishments. He counted your gray hairs. So if you had them, you know, and, you know, he wasn't like the kind of guy that wanted to embarrass people or, you know, so he was, you know, he just kept it straight, kept everything the same, you know, eventually these people will retire and I'll put in other guys. But Bratton's like, hey, I don't know anybody, anything. And I want to put my team on I, a new team and I want people like minded guys. I mean, there was certainly some age discrimination involved, you know, anybody over 50 has to be shot. Fortunately, I was young then. But, you know, you know, but in many ways, he was the only guy that could do this thing, make this overwhelming change. So even if they today they point to me, police commissioner, I says, I'm going in there, I'm cleaning house. I had enough of this shit. I'm cleaning house and firing everybody. Well, the next thing is my phone starts to ring. Oh, hey, Billy, you know, uh, you know, some old partner. Hey, Billy, this guy that you're firing here, you know, he was my partner for a while. He saved my life. Or, hey, Billy, this guy is my, my nephew. You can't do that. Hey, Billy. Is... And the next thing you know, is like the only guy I can fire is, or, well, not fire, fire, but the only guy I can remove from his current title is some sergeant in Staten Island because everybody's connected to everybody else. So, and, you know, so I, the, um, the uh, desire for fresh blood and fresh ideas, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a reformer by nature. I, I admire that. Even though my chief, I worked for Chief Salvaggi, the chief of patrol, was a great guy and a sharp guy. But, you know, it's like, hey, I want to put, I want Bratton loyalists. I don't want, you know, Kelly loyalists or, uh, you know, whoever, whoever made him chief of patrol. So you know, it's interesting. Uh, Timony did an interview, not for me, because. He's no longer with us as well, uh, but with uh, John Jay College a few years ago, um, and it's in the archives there. And um, he says that um, he was very worried about, you know, people he knew, he that he liked, that he respected, because uh, he was given the task of drawing up a good chunk of the command staff because Branton didn't know them. Um, he said he got no pushback from, um, from uh, was it Kelleher or something? Um, well, and Branton, I forget, I'm sorry, the name's. There are a lot of them. And then, uh, but, but he got no pushback, which surprised him. He commented on that, that he was able to say, here's a clean slate. And, and, and you know, I mean, these guys were undoubtedly talented, you know, uh, you know, uh, it turns out, you know, that, 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 you know, the choices, the choices were pretty sound. So you um, had been working for Salvaggi and then uh, Louis Animon comes in as, as your new, uh, as, as the, he was a new chief, chief right of of patrol right yeah and uh, and your boss so how well, does that... i knew affect me is that uh, and, right i know louis from before because when i was with chief of patrol and i mentioned this in regards to the city city hall riots because that was something is that uh there was like i was like uh, the jack of all trades i was like okay uh, so uh, when they started with the emergency mobilization I think it was after Crown Heights, but before after Crown Heights, Washington Heights, I lose the uh, the, the uh, uh, progression. But after one of those things, they says no, and this grew out of Tompkins Square Park, so it might have been after after that. But whatever it was, so it says no, we need a more coordinated response. We can't. It had to be after Crown Heights because they wanted to chase. It, it, it was Crown Heights. The, it was Crown Heights. chasing the crowds all over the place. But the thing is, is that each of these things we learned a little. And so finally, they said, well, no, we need a more organized plan to respond to, uh, to this stuff. So, um, uh, so Louis was in charge of it, but I was the liaison for the chief of patrol. I think and this Louis is what came out of in... it. Ah, so yes. Okay. Given to me by uh, Louis Animone himself. It's the New York City Police Department Disorder Control Guidelines. Well, I had a hand in that. I wouldn't be surprised if I wrote it, you know, but... Yeah, but um, and all these little um, pamphlets as well. Did you write those? These various. Yeah, yeah. I doubt it. I don't remember the pamphlets. Okay, but uh, curbing youth violence, uh, bringing fugitives to justice, getting guns off the street. No, 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 that's. But uh, no, I can't claim credit for those. But I was involved in the disorder control, and that's why one of the things with the Crown Heights riots, not the Crown, the City Hall riot, is that we learned was when you call a mobilization, you can bring people down, you can't bring them to the scene. You have to put them park far away and march in because it took them forever to get to get the task forces to uh, to City Hall because all of the traffic, all of the cops in the street. So you couldn't. So it's like, no, find a mobilization point somewhere far away and then march them in was that was the Louis Tyan there. But I knew Louis already. 
But Louis came in and he was he was skeptical of the, the, the house mouses. You know, he was skeptical of headquarters. You know, he was a rough and tumble guy, you know. And, uh, you know, eventually, like even after we started Comstat, we had a, he decided to do a desk order. You know, uh, you know, I had to suffer the humiliation of, uh, of justifying my job. It's like, I don't know. You don't want me to do this. Fine. You do the book. You know, but, uh, you know, we had to go up to the Office of Management Analysis and Planning and you tell them why we were so great. Only because we were doing shit that they couldn't do. So, you know, that's why. Yeah, the traditionally the um, OMAP, the Office of Management and Planning, it's like education and training. One of those things that, uh, you know, we say is an oxymoron because there wasn't too much. Um, it's kind of, well, uh, it, it improved later, but it wasn't like oh, uh, it was a. Well, I was I was equate them to the Jesuit order. I mean, one of the police department has two managerial models. One's the Soviet Union, and the other the other is the Roman Catholic Church. But like like in the Roman Catholic Church, the only people who are allowed to say why are the Jesuits. You know, why do we do that? And that was one great thing about Brighton. He was like, well, unless I do that anymore, if you didn't have a proper answer. But you know, everything else is like you know, everything was everybody's in lockstep. Everybody's on the same page. They often missed you know because of political aspirations or fear or lack of ideas or whatever it is, they missed all of these opportunities to, to come up with the answer to that question. You know, why? So, uh, you know, so they were aloof and they were special and they were separate from the rest of us, uh, you know, uh, plebs in lockstep. And so how, so you, um, who, how did it get, so t- tell me how Comstat started. Um, at this well, time. mine differs a little from uh, Brighton's, but understand this is all through the mists of uh, 30 odd years uh, going on and also through the mists of the other people's view. Everything's like, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the blind guy's trying to describe the elephant. Well, this is 30 years long. They're trying to describe their memories of this elephant. In the movie so, Rashomon. <laughs> yes. That, I was going to say Rashomon, but I don't want to go. I, I don't want to go full intellectual, you know, or, but anyway. So uh, here's my understand, my recollection of it, and maybe in that uh, um, article I sent you, which I can resend. Uh, but anyway, um, Brighton wanted to have a weekly meeting with somebody from each, with all of the, a representative from each of the bureaus. Let's all get together, sort of like a weekly state of department or what's going on, what's happening here. So, and... Maples told, they, they were going to send the captain from the chief patrol's office, and they said, uh, and bring some crime stats. And this was the big, this is the knee buckling moment because, you know, the last thing I have, I have last year's crime stats from the rest of crime coding because nobody wanted to use preliminary numbers. That was the excuse for everything. Oh, you can't use preliminary numbers. They're not accurate. They're not good. They're not, they'll be accurate to, within a certain degree. You know, I mean, you know, Brighton's not a dope. He would say, okay, you know, I understand the preliminary. So some of these are going to, you know, so, some of these are going to be robberies that, don't, that you don't have listed as robberies. Some of them that you have listed as robberies are going to not be robberies. It just, you know, he, you know, he was a cop. So, but I, it was like a disaster. Uh, and how are we going to, we got to get um, um, uh, weekly stats. How are we going to do this? And we had to, um, uh, they asked us how we could do this. And John Yo, who was working on, if you read the, you know, in the book, he was doing something with quality of life stats. And that, you know, so people were sending, were sending stats up to the office every week. But then he had to redo this thing so that they could, because he was using a more modern program and they were using something else. They were using our um, uh, proprietary software. So he had to come up with something, a way to get it from that to this and then, and then all of that stuff. So in the book, you know, Bratton has me given the convoluted. This is um, a, this uh, is Bratton's book you're talking about. Bratton's right? recent book, right? Yeah. But he has he, he has me given the um, uh, the convoluted exp- uh, explanation to uh, um, uh, Kelleher and Maple. I seem to remember more like John was given. John Yo was given the convoluted because um, he certainly was. Most of it was convoluted even to me. Well, let, let me uh, quote, let me quote John Yo here if I could. This is um I, I he's quoting he's quoting Jack Maple. This is John Yo quoting Jack Maple. Look, I've been everywhere. I talk to these boneheads and these meatheads and they give me a crock of crap telling me it's going to take six months to a year to come up with a prototype to consider how to add up these numbers. And look, man, we just want to know how many big crimes are happening happening in the city. Can you do something? 
And John says, all right, give me a couple days, not months. No, no, a couple days. I'll let you know. And uh, <laughs> well, and I, I just seem to remember him like they asking, well, how does this work? You know, of course, like they would understand it. And I seem to remember John giving the spiel that they did that, that crossed their eyes over. And Kelleher was much more along the lines of, can it, can it, can we do this? And I go, yeah. And he says, well, make sure it happens. Make sure this works. Was, was, that's the, 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 the word I remember from this. Make sure this works. You know, because again, in headquarters, you don't want to put your name on something and then have it fail. You know, so this, is, then, this is February of 91. Um, February there, was a, 91. there was a snowstorm. Yo uh, goes to um, Brooklyn and uh, to his grandma's house and writes the code. And, and he says, not, this is not complicated, um, fancy computer stuff. Now, still, it's 91. So it's fancy to most people. And he's, you know, got a five and a quarter inch floppy hooked up to a three and a half inch floppy to, for extra memory. Um, he's using Fox Pro in a program called Smart. Um, but all it is, is it's, it's a batch file that compiles statistics. It's, 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 you know, it's like a small Excel spreadsheet, if I'm not mistaken, is basically right. all this stuff is doing. So Taking basically, right. I, I, I forget which way you did it, but, but it was like, okay, maybe it was all on one, one thing, but it's like, okay, Monday, I had one robbery. Tuesday, I had zero robberies. Tuesday, and they had three robbers and just put in numbers and you do this and you do that. I mean, the first, the first one was since we were six weeks into, into the year, which says, okay, do it twice, do it this year and last year. But other than that, it was just like, okay, just put in the numbers, which was actually not as simple as it sounds because people found a way to screw it up no matter what you do. Um, one of them was we had to run um, uh, tests on it um, because, you know, Rape in the first degree is a subset of overall of overall rapes. Said, so, but people, every was like, uh, 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 you know, that there'd be six rape ones and three rapes. It's like, no, that's not how this works. So we had to run through the stats every week, and then like we had to look for like outlying numbers, like so. I don't know what the number was, but say it's like more than so and so grand losses in a week, and. One week, the Midtown South had 613 grand larcenies. And it's like, holy shit. I mean, I had been the desk officer in the, in, the, in, the, the, in the Midtown South. So I knew that was just not possible. You know, I, my hand would have fallen off signing all those 61s. So I called the CEO. I go, what, what happened here? It was, turns out it was 61, you know? you know. But they lost. But they sent up the figures because we made them sign off on the figures every week. You had to sign. I have personally reviewed these numbers. And the CEO would have to sign it. And somehow you missed that you threw in an extra 550 odd um, uh, grand larcenies and just missed it. People didn't think of crime that way. It's just like, okay, yeah, there's a lot of crime here. And so what at this era and before this era, if there are a lot of crimes, what's um, how is performance judged? Okay, well, they had, well, one, lack of scandal, uh, two, lack of personnel problems. Uh, a three, lack of community friction with the police department. Community could be at war with itself or the parts of the community could be feel free to be at war with yourselves as long as you're not at war with the police department. But they had, there was one thing with the precinct commanders, they had a weekly, we actually, there's some sort of stats you sent up. There was a weekly report that you sent in that listed a whole bunch of numbers, but it was typed. It was, you know, had, you, you send it in and they had a weekly robbery meeting. But you were absolved from having a lot of robberies if you had 35 robbery arrests for every 100 robberies. So you have 100 robberies and you have 38 robbery arrests, well, you're absolved because you're doing your job to fight. Is robbery. that the real number or you're just speaking hypothetically? No, 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 it's 35%. The clearance rate had to be 35%. Okay. The arrest rate. Right. 35%. So, but the, the, the great thing is, is, um, the the, the 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 holy grail would be so you're at the, the border of the seventh and the ninth precincts you're on Houston Street. So somebody on the north side of Houston Street commits a robbery, or six guys on the north side of Houston Street commit a robbery, and they run across and I arrest them in the seventh precinct. I have six robbery arrests and they have the robbery. So it wasn't exactly the the most uh, uh, edifying kind of statistic. <laughs> so, it, but but that was it. You were clear. Okay, we had a meeting. Okay, and that's that. You know, that's how the concept meetings evolved. Was that 
in the beginning when we were doing Comstat, I mean, of course, there were all of the technical well, so problems, all of the, the... Get to that in one second. Let me take you back. What was your impression of, no. oh, was he new Animum? So how did he, how did the mood of the office change when it transferred from Salvaggi to, um, to Animum? Well, it was very, it was very, st- it was a staid, not staid, but it was, it was a functioning office and it was like, you know, you know what the chief wanted and, and every, you know, everything just went along. Okay. You do what the chief wanted, you know. And, you know, like I was a lieutenant there. Was a, his guy was a captain, uh, Billy Connors, was a great guy. And like, OK, you know, like make sure the chief gets what he wants and everybody's everybody's there. Everything's everything. But now Louis comes in. Well, Louis is young, gung ho, um, uh, skeptical about uh, the house mouses. And you don't know what he wants. So like now it's like, well, what the fuck? So I was OK because they brought in uh Pat Kelleher has his XO and I knew Kelleher from Manhattan South. And, you know, we, you know, we were, but as in so far as you can be. So, so I, I was always going to be all right, but people like what, you know, because Louis was skeptical about people that just kept numbers, but you know, somebody has to do this. Somebody has to be cooked in the army. Somebody has to feed these people. You want, you know, you want tires on your car, somebody, uh, you know, on your, or, or, you know, your staff car, somebody has to get those things. So it's like, you know, but not knowing what it was about, you know, the headquarters thing was about. Louis was, let's call him a disruptor. It's probably one of the nicer ways it's been put for him. Um, so, the, well, you know, but he was an effective guy. Was, you know, huh? Yeah. And I mean, I should, I should mention he's a friend of mine. I'm no, I don't mean that maliciously at all. I mean that affects affectionately. Um, how, and so, the, so you have these weekly meetings, right? And the first, they're like on the, second floor or they move down or up or the other they're wait you're, you're putting this together on the fly right well before we had that there right but before we had that there i would go to the borough robbery meetings to try to spread the word of comstat you know this was you know saint paul and timothy going out and doing our thing and what happens is it's like because to be problems, oh, this is causing overtime. Oh, we shouldn't have to do this on this day. Oh, you know, you're making people stay late. And then the big thing was, my, my big thing was the divide by zero. The police department, for, for, for a million years, it's like if you had no robberies this year and you had two, no robberies last year and you had two this year, it's a 200% increase. And they're fighting you on it. Well, how else do you map that? And I says, you don't. It's undefined. And then finally, one chief says, she goes, getting sh- shirty with me. And I go, I'm sorry, sir. The chief of patrol does not divide by zero. <laughs> and I was that. I love that line. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but anyway, so <clears throat> so Maple knew and yeah, Jack knew we were going out there and you know trying to preach the word and get these people on board. You know, for me, it was mostly, mostly mostly get the fucking stats in, will you? You know, I want to go home. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, 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 Jack was like, what are they saying out there? What are they doing? Are they, are they trying to figure out what they're doing? And, you know, and uh, so he says, geez, it wouldn't be great if we have them go to all of those meetings. And, you know, and I'm trying to go to all these meetings. Why don't we have them come down here? So they, were, they had two robbery meetings a month. They said, that, no, you have to do one of them in headquarters. So I was kind of done on the fly where um, uh you know, come down and do your meeting. You're the host of the meeting, which, you know, you run, you're, you're doing everything in a meeting. We're just sitting here in, in, the, in the pews and in the, in the press room on the second floor. So, you know, there were, there were some guys made fat and some guys didn't, you know, but, uh, you know, that's, that's how it started. Then we then came the, the, the pin mapping and all of that. And, you know, uh, but in the initial, it was just guys standing there, uh, you know, quaking for their careers. Was it a fair process? Um, it was if you knew what you were doing. If you came down, like Jack was always like, oh, this guy's got that hangdog look. You know, Jack was, was, was into the, the physiognomy a little bit. But, you know, it's like guys like, uh, you know, the tired mustaches. Like Jack had no time for them. <laughs> so, so he'd be extra sharp. But if you were young, or even not even young, but you were on the ball, just like Joe Dunn made big out of it. And Patty Brennan, Lord of Mercy, I'm too big out of it. But it's like if you're on the ball and you're enthusiastic and you're thinking, then you're um, um, uh, then you got to then you do you will live. And in fact, some prospered. 
But, uh, you know, if you were there, like, shrugging your shoulders, you died. You know? I mean, you watch Korea, it's just, just gone. Right down so the drain. So, again, right cor- you. you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but just to explain this to people who don't know. So, up through the rank of captain in the NYPD is civil service. Beyond that, promotion, um, and it goes from there to deputy inspector, inspector, and then various starred chiefs, the proverbial oak leaf, um, those are at just the discretion of the police commissioner. Um, yep. So at these, and the precinct commanders are either captains or deputy inspectors or inspectors. Um, so you can get bumped down to captain, in which case you would probably retire for pension reasons, um, but you get reassigned. Um, so it's not, you're not, you know, of course you're not being literally killed and you're not being fired. Yeah, right. Right. But well, we use those expressions interchangeably. I just want to make this clear. You know what, what right. is actually happening is you could be a right. you could be a, a inspector precinct commander in Manhattan, and suddenly you're your captain in, in in the motor pool. Well, no one, to the best of my knowledge, no one got demoted out of it because that's okay. like that's like so so extreme. It's it's not. I I took and I don't I have no recollection of any of that. Okay, I, I, uh, that, never that, even that, being Thank you for correcting me because I'm, yes. I'm I'm not saying that based on fact. Yeah, uh, and it's certainly, um, but it's certainly possible. But but you could be an inspector running Midtown North, the the crown, the, the, the jewel in the crown, as they like to say. And the next thing is you're an inspector of the uh, uh, accountant of the, the Husky Dogs in Siberia. <laughs> you know, and so you so, know your career is dead. Uh, you know, yeah. That's the, I mean, um, they're still paying you. And again, you died. Yeah. Yeah. And and usually, but now you just, now you just punch the clock. And usually at that point, you start planning your retirement, it seems. Indeed. I mean, I, I, you know, I I have to say the pressure, it was, it was a crucible in there. It was, it got hot. And to this day, I'm stunned that there has been no gunplay. That nobody says, okay, yeah, go ahead. I'm because I, I, I mean, you still guys, it was like so, sometimes it got really bad in there, but it, it didn't it didn't start off bad. It's like, you know, when you were like just not going through the motions, then they the, Louie and Jack played off each other and they were just now now they're going and now you got problems, you know, but when guys see their career die, I'm really surprised that nobody, you know. And so what were but, they saying that when they were? When they were getting aggressive, doing their their shtick almost. Uh, what I mean, what's what's going on? What, how do you fail? Well, so it's young? like you yeah. know they do it. Well, one is you don't have answers. You know, well there was one precinct commander from Staten Island, and everything. So the one two zero has got some robberies. The one two two is much quieter. The one two three is you know uh, uh, Mayberry RFD. So the press commander from the one, two, three comes up and pretty pleased saying, I only had three robberies last week. And Louis goes, tell me about each of them. Of course, the guy with a hundred robberies doesn't know he has a breakdown, but she says, I want to know what happened in each of those robberies. I want you to tell me what time, you know, and it's like, uh, because you, you know, and so here's a beat down for you. And it's like, well, how come this and how come that? And like, and the other thing is like, uh, people would say the, the, the trap you want to fall into, is, don't want to fall into is like, you know, it's really hard out there. And, and one Louis was a priest command and two Louis goes, how hard is it for the people living in the projects? You think it's hard for you? How about the people who live there? You think it's hard for them? And it's like, and we're off to the races. You know? So. Uh, now some people thrive though on this, right? Oh, go, no, go on, go on. Honey. Absolutely. So, right, no, some guys, um, uh, were rah rah guys. Some guys were just uber prepared. Joe Dunn was one of them. He came in, he, you know, because he came in with flashcards and he had index cards in his hand and he would shuffle them for time. You know, I mean, I know we knew what he was doing, but he would also eventually come to the one with the answer on it. You know, he never got to the one that says, say you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, well, of course he was doing it to, you know, get his, to get his head together, but it's like, okay. And he made fat out of that. And he was, you know, you know, now he was in the seven five and crime came down a great deal in the seven five. But then on the other hand, they had more crime to give. You know, if you're in a slow priest in Queens, you're in, you know, in Maspeth, there's only so much crime you have and, and so much crime you can reduce there. You know, you can you can say, oh, I dropped 30 homicides this year or 50 homicides. And it's like, you know, 
probably the other guy's working hard at trying to find crime to reduce. Um, but because we were talking about this before I started recording, uh, uh, Joe Lochran said he, he loved to present there. He said it was hard, you know, he was nervous, but um, but he said, you know, gave him a chance to show off and to say good things about the people who work for him. Yeah. And, and, thrived. and Arnie Storch thrived on it, he said, you yeah. know. Absolutely. They said some guys just love being up there and other guys are just like, and of course, in the beginning, the resistance was I'm now I'm getting, uh, I'm being uh, called out in public. And that's probably one of the other things is that in the old days, you know, the, you know, the, the borough commander would call you up and say, hey, Peter, you know, hey, you know, you got to straighten this out here or, you know, crimes up. But now it's like you're standing in front of everybody. You know, and you're the big kahuna back home, back in the in the, your precinct, and now you're getting fucking dressed down in front of everybody. So it was a tough transition for a lot of guys to make, and guys that guys, sorry, there, guys that didn't um, um, didn't make didn't make the transition, didn't make the team. Hmm. Um, no, I it's I'm not the first person to say this, but um, you know, there are a couple benefits. I mean, at some level. I mean, this had led to crime going down. It was an accountability tool. It wasn't magic. It was simply saying, this is your job. All it is. Right. All it is is an accountability tool. And everybody thinks it's some sort of magic shape, but it's not. It's like, if I, if you know, if I call you on, if it just saves time. That's all it is. If I'm the police commissioner and I call you up and I say, Peter, how many crimes you have last week? And you say, 30. And he says, how many, how many have last year? 10. I go, well, what the fuck are you doing? It's the same thing, except it saves me time. I don't have to, I don't have to call every priest commander, you know? So this is, that's what it is. But all it is is a fast accountability tool. There's not, the, there's no magic here, but you have to want to do it. To reduce crime is a political decision. You know, the mayor has to want to do this. The city council or the local council people, whoever they are, they have to want to do this. The cops will do whatever they tell them to do. You know, they, you know they'll do it. You want to crime down, you got it. But you got to want it. If you don't want it, you know, or if you want peace, which is, all what they, which is what they want at the moment, well, then that's fine. Have fun. I'll just sit here. But if you want the crime down, yeah, I know how to do that. We know how to do that. There's, um, I mean, from the Kerner Commission in, the, in 69 to, um, or 68 to uh, Comstat, I think there was a, a long period where, police and um, mayors simply said it's not crime isn't our deal that's society um, that I kind of changed in the 90s in New York City I think um, I worry you know today I see once again for the first time uh, I, I'm not certain of the city so I don't want to name it but a police uh, commissioner last year was asked what Grady would give himself um, and the city had a record high homicide rate and, you know, up, up six, 50% from last year, he said, I'd give myself an A. And I thought, nah, this is not, um, yeah. it might, you know, I'm not saying it's all your fault, but if yeah. if shootings double, you don't deserve an A, damn it. Um, you, your priorities are wrong. Right. Be, uh, wait, tell, listen, tell it to the families of the dead people. You know, I mean, give me a break. You know, you someone know, what, was um, what else are you chatting to with do me here? today about some, a bunch of uh, academics were talking about, you know, policing issues. And he just said, not one of them has ever stood over a dead body. Um, yep. Now, I don't know, no. if, you know, I, you know, I you know, does that matter? I, I, maybe a little, uh, but, you know, I don't want to, it's not that everyone has to deal with that, but, but it, 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 it it's have a game changer. Passive, but you have to see the, you know, you, ha you have to see the, uh, um, the fruits of your non-labor. You have to see that this is like, okay, you know, and you, you have to understand that this is a choice that, you know, you've you've said, I value whatever uh, over over reducing crime. And it's just that's the way it is. And you're saying crime, you're saying crime is unimportant. In that case, let's get rid of the police. I mean, you know, OK, do the other stuff. And I'm not saying there aren't good ways to spend money, you know, um, uh, you know. Uh, you know, I'd be pouring money into uh, uh, into mental health and, uh, you know, yeah, you know, be my let first me, let priority, me add a that's another that. story. It's because, well, it's an important one because it's it's really something that needs to be done and it's potentially a low hanging fruit, even over form. I'm not talking about co-response and who responds. You know, cops do us. A, I mean, you know, they're not I mean, perfect. They do a pretty good job. The problem is if you need a response, you fail. 
Um, I don't give it at that point. I don't care who responds. I want the person to be cared for. So the mother doesn't call and say, my son's, you know, going crazy and threatening me. That's what we lack is that basic, um, you know, that basic preventative mental health care. You know, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, you know, un understood that, you know, like, you know, I, I, you know, I've seen in other cities, you know, you see the street conditions and a lot of this is like, wow, it's, it, this is opioid city. And there's a lot of, you know, everybody doing the opioid yoga, but the, uh, here it's like, it's untreated mental health. You get, you get in the subway, then you come out of the subway and it's like, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, there's a, a real buzz in the air here that, uh, uh, and that, 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 that buzz is, you know, could probably use a bit of Thorazine. And um, I mean, some of that, of course, you know, maybe we don't have to um, completely solve homelessness to solve some of these problems. I mean, the, the mental illness in the subway, that again, as you said, it, it's a choice. It's a political choice that changed under de Blasio when they went from oh. from enforcement to offering services. Well, when people decline well, services, what me, do you do? To me, mental health is the, is the first step in treating homelessness, you know? you know, uh, and treating the subways. It's like, you know, I want to get you healthy enough so that you say, no, riding subway 24 hours a day living in this in this, this sardine can is not good for me. And they give them a home and this way I don't burn it down, you know, and I can live in a setting with other people. That's, you know, like I, there's the whole, the, the, you know, and then preventing that too. I mean, there's, there's, there's mental health problems coming up that ben, basically – through childhood, that we're just waiting for them, saving them a seat on the subway, if you pardon the expression. Well, I also think the other, you know, the community matters. Um, I'd love to help people, um, though, you know, that's not my professional field, so I leave that to others who don't seem to be doing it. Um, but I do ride the subway. Um, you know, as a subway rider, my, my, my voice should count, too. Um, you know, but... Um, how so did just even, even if you never, even if you never rode the subway in your life, you have to say, this just isn't right. This is right. The, the, the subway is a rolling, a, a rolling insane asylum without doctors, without orderlies, without meals. It's like, you know, I mean, we're really leaving these people out there just to, to their own devices to die. I mean, go, go, you know, maybe they'll die in the tunnel and we won't find them for years. But, you know, how about it? Um, thanks for listening. I would really like to thank my guest, William Gorta, G-O-R-T-A. I am Peter Moskos, and this is Quality Policing. And as always, um, there's more at qualitypolicing.com. And please stay tuned because um, this discussion will continue in the next episode because um, there's so much good stuff um, to be said. Thanks, Peter.